Well, um, I hope you can all see and hear us. Uh, and welcome to the third in the series of Red Lion webinars for 2020. Uh, my name is Richard Sutton. I'm a silk at Red Lion Chambers. Uh, I'm broadly based in criminal work, but specialized in corporate crime and revenue work as well, both prosecuting and defending. Before we lose uh, the screenshot, which I hope you can all see, because you're gonna be disappearing very shortly from your screen, can I just mention Tom Davis, who's assisted us all very much in the presentation of uh, this webinar. Um, to say you won't see his face for very long, but thank you, Tom, both in research and indeed putting together the uh, IT presentation. So thank you very much indeed for that, in case I forget. Right, now today's subject, it is director's liability and disqualification. I think we need to define our terms from the outset, as it were, uh, particularly in relation to what is meant by director, because as you will hear uh, later on during the course of, of the webinar, uh, that has widened quite considerably in the last few years. Uh, we're not only gonna be looking at the position of de facto directors, that's to say those who act as directors, which may include those who are formerly uh, nominated and those who are not. But we're also going to be looking at, obviously, shadow directors. And now, and more importantly, perhaps, members of the senior management in a corporation, together with other officers of the company. And you'll see that, in fact, uh, the liabilities that we're looking at intend, uh, tend to extend further than just those directors who are formally nominated. We believe this subject may become fairly topical in the near future, simply because of the crisis with the coronavirus. Uh, it seems like many businesses are going to suffer, and as they suffer, and if indeed they go towards liquidation, that's the very time when those who are in control of the company are likely to have their actions uh, closely scrutinized by others. And sad to say that may be the time when in fact a number of directors are going to have to answer some very telling questions. Let me give you an idea of the plan of this webinar. We're gonna start with a look at the criminal liability as it's imposed by a number of statutes, mainly over the course of the last 20 years or so. Uh, and we'll be looking not only, as I say, at the liabilities of directors, but also those of some of the senior management. We'll then move on gradually to look at certain civil liabilities and obligations. Uh, and uh, these arise from the various Companies Act and the Corporate Code. And finally, and equally importantly, we're going to move to the area of disqualification. These are the sanctions or one of the sanctions that can be imposed if the director fails to achieve what is required of him. Following upon uh, dealing with those topics as part of our speakers' presentations, we're going to then have a period of discussion of certain specified topics. And these are topics which we think have arisen from the presentations and ought to be examined more fully. They will include, for example, has the, the legislation, recent legislation, widened the ambit of criminal liability? Uh, is disqual disqualification uh, more penal than uh, preventative, and how much more so that is the case. And in particular, we want to look at, if we have time, conflicts between uh, the individual and the corporate entity. Because of the um, shortness of time of this seminar, we would obviously welcome questions, but we're not sure we'd actually have time for questions. So let me ask you, please, if there are questions and we don't have time for them, can you please ask those questions on the app, through the app, as it were, as the uh, seminar, the webinar, webinar is progressing. Uh, we will then um, assimilate those questions and indeed we'll provide answers either if we have time in this lecture, but I suspect we won't, or uh, by sending those answers to those who request them uh, online, uh, because our two speakers have kindly offered for the few days after this webinar to uh, deal with those questions. Can I just please say questions about the content of the webinar? It's not an offer for free advice. 
Uh, and then, so far as the webinar itself is concerned, you'll be able to uh, download the webinar on the Chambers website, 18 uh, Red Lion Chambers website. Uh, and so you can go there if you wish to remind yourself of this webinar. Can I now please to turn to the introduction of the speakers? I'm not going to reintroduce myself, but we're going to do them in order that they address you. Rufus de Cruz goes first. Uh, he's a present member of Red Lion Chambers, an experienced leading junior who prosecutes and defends in serious, complex, and multi-handed criminal fraud, regulatory, and international cases. It obviously involves a large amount of corporate work. He's particularly experienced in representing and advising corporate clients in relation to health and safety and environment agency offences. He also deals with money laundering matters, production orders relating to special procedure material, uh, LLP, LPP, and uh, corporate fraud. Next, we'll ask Ruby to address you. Ruby Hammond is a partner at Ashurst. She was previously a member of Red Lion Chambers, is now a partner at Ashurst LLP where she co-leads the firm's global corporate crime practice. Her career has involved prosecuting financial crime, uh, financial conduct authority, revenue and customs, Crown Prosecution Service. She's defended, it, defended in corruption cases and litigated a broad range of regulatory and disciplinary cases. Uh, Ruby specialized in global investigations, corporate crime and financial service litigation and regulation. She's acted uh, in two of the CMA's recent directors of qualification cases, and I suspect we'll hear something about that when she gives her paper. Finally, before I ask them to present their presentations, can I just mention one other matter, and that's this. We're only looking at those who hold either a directorial position or, or, or a management, senior management position in this case. You'll appreciate, as we shall probably see as we go through the webinar, that of course each person who behaves criminally in a company may be liable on a personal basis, but we're looking and focusing at this stage on those who hold an office. And you'll also bear in mind, please, uh, that it may be or will be the case that even though a director or a senior management officer does not get prosecuted, or indeed the company, those who involve themselves in crime during the course of uh, any corporate behavior may end up facing charges. Well, now that's all I want to say by way of introduction. Uh, I'm now going to ask, please, Rufus um, Cruz to give you his paper. Rufus, over to you. Thank you, Richard, and good afternoon. Um, I will be focusing on the liability side of the equation, defining duties, elements of offences, various offences that create criminal liability for directors. And as Richard pointed out, not just directors, but senior managers and others, uh, as we will hear under various legislation. So the focus will be criminal liability and criminal procedure and sentence. In the limited time that we have, we'll be doing no more than giving you an overview of these areas, but we hope that it will be a useful one. So starting at the top with who is a director? Well, the most common form of directors, what's referred to as a de jure director, someone formally appointed in accordance with the procedure in a company's articles of association and consenting to act in such a capacity. There are also de facto directors defined under the 1994 authority of Hydrodan Corby Limited as a person who assumes to act as a director, he or she is held out as a director by the company and claims and purports to be a, a director, um, although never actually or validly having been appointed as such. Uh, and the third level of director that often arises, uh, again in that same 1994 authority, is defined as a shadow director in this way. Someone who claims not to be a director, he lurks in the shadows, sheltering behind others who he claims are the only directors of the company to the exclusion of himself. He's not held out as a director by the company. However, it is now accepted that the binary distinction in that authority between the de facto director and the shadow director is not necessarily appropriate. And it is widely recognized that there is an overlap in the two concepts and the authority of 2010 authority of revenue versus Holland establishes that. Furthermore, uh, in the case of um, Smithson Limited versus Naga, uh, 2014 authority, uh, 
Lady Justice Arden um, pointed out that the question whether the director is a de facto or shadow director is a question of fact and degree. The Companies Act 2006 imposes the following general duties on directors, and they're listed there between section 171 to 177, amongst the more important ones perhaps are section 173, the duty to exercise independent judgment, 174, the duty to exercise reasonable care, skill and diligence, uh, section 175 and 177, the duty to avoid conflicts of interest and to declare an interest in proposed transaction or arrangement. So what is the effect of uh, a breach of those general duties? Well, the Companies Act 2006 mostly focuses on civil liabilities. However, the general duties may still be relevant in criminal cases when considering whether a director uh, is in breach of his duties and in committing offences which we'll see couched in terms of consenting, conniving or neglecting in an offence committed by a company, for example, some of those general duties as defined under the 2006 Act may come into play. For example, Section 173, uh, the duty to exercise independent judgment in Section 174, the duty to exercise reasonable care, skill and diligence. The Companies Act does create um, a few specific criminal, uh, criminal offences, for example, Section 183, the offence of failing to declare an interest in an existing transaction or arrangement. So what is the significance of criminal liability for directors? What are the consequences? Well, the consequences can be severe. Uh, firstly, um, fines, community order or custody can be imposed, as well as or disqualification under the Company Directors Disqualification Act 1986. Where a director personally commits an indictable criminal offence, they may be liable to be disqualified where their uh, criminal actions have, as per the 97 authority of Goodman, quote, some relevant factual connection with the management of the company. And we'll see that the Company Directors Disqualification Act 1986 and Section 2 is an important part of this whole area. And we'll be hearing more about that in Ruby's talk. Turning to uh, the ways in which uh, prosecutions are proceeded against directors, well, the most often the simplest way for prosecutions to proceed is to charge directors as part of the uh, conspiracy. And the Barclays case was an example of that, albeit it was an unsuccessful example because the directors in that case were acquitted, uh, as we know, after a very short time. Uh, and in that case, the conspiracy involved a conspiracy largely to commit a Section 2 offence under the Fraud Act. In terms of the level of liability of a director, can a director himself or herself be prosecuted for offences committed by a company? The short answer is in some circumstances, yes. There are various pieces of legislation which provide for that scenario. The types of offence you'll see under these acts, such as the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 and Section 37 in particular, or indeed more recently, the Bribery Act 2010, Section 14, all contain the following common elements. An offence is committed by a body corporate, but two, with the consent, connivance, or neglect, neglect doesn't appear in all of the offences, but in some, on the part of not just a director, as we've already stressed, but very often a senior manager, secretary, or similar officer, but also, in terms of the concepts of de facto director and shadow director, what is important is a person purporting to act in such a capacity. And lastly, the offence, therefore, is one committed by the director, senior manager, officer, and the body corporate. Uh, uh, and in those circumstances, the director shall be guilty of that offence and shall be proceeded against and punished accordingly. Uh, the, the level of liability, therefore, is secondary liability because it's secondary to the primary liability of the company itself. And as I mentioned, in uh, these offences uh, where consent and connivance are involved, sometimes neglect is an additional limb, sometimes it is not, as we will see. So looking at those concepts, what do they mean, consent, connivance and neglect? Well, the old authority of Huckabee and Elliot provides simple definitions. Uh, consent, an offence is committed with the consent of the director if he is well aware what was going on and agreed to it. 
Connivance, on the other hand, is an offence where committed where the connivance of the director is equally well aware of what was going on, but his agreement was tacit, not actively encouraging what happened, but letting it continue and saying nothing about it. Or in those instances where neglect is in limb, an offence is committed with the consent of the director if he has, quote, omitted or neglected to do something which he or she ought to have done. And it's important to note that the behaviour, uh, knowledge rather, that the behaviour is legal, is irrelevant as the Attorney General's reference number one of 1995 establishes. The Crown do not have to prove that the Director had knowledge of each individual instance of malfeasance by the company. Knowledge of the policy to participate in that behaviour is enough, as the authority of Hutchins and Cheryl Lambus from 2011 established. Uh, in terms of uh, instances of consent, connivance and neglect and further definitions of how that's applied, in this case, the authority of Wertherspoon, another um, old authority, 1978, still holds good. There, in that case, the following points were made in terms of the nature of the offence. Firstly, the question is whether the director has failed to take some steps to prevent the commission of an offence by the corporation. Secondly, if the taking of those steps either expressly falls or, three, should be held to fall within the scope of the functions of the office, which he holds. In all cases, accordingly, the functions of the office of the person charged with a contravention, in this case, Section 37 of the Health and Safety Work Act, will be a highly relevant consideration for any judge or jury. And lastly, the question whether there was on his part, her part, as the holder of this, his particular office, a failure to take such a step, which he or she could have taken, will fail fall to be answered in the light of the whole circumstances of the case, including the state of mind of the director uh, for the need for action or the existence of a state of fact requiring action to be taken, of which he or she should have been aware. So those are the basic definitions of consent, connivance and neglect. Um, as we've indicated, there are slight variations in those concepts in the particular offences under particular acts. So, for example, under the Bribery Act 2010, Section 14, and Fraud Act 2006, Section 12, the elements of liability are only consent or connivance. Neglect is not a limb that attracts liability. And if we look at the Bribery Act 2010, we see there under Section 14, that under section 14 one, uh, sort of section 14.2, the offence, as I've indicated, is proved to be committed with the consent or connivance, but no mention of neglect. Neglect doesn't apply. And those who are caught by this section are A, a senior officer of the body corporate or Scottish partnership, or B, a person purporting to act in such a capacity. And it goes on, the senior officer or person, as well as the body corporate or partnership, is guilty of the offence and liable to be proceeded against and punished accordingly. Uh, and so again, we see it's not just director, but senior officer who is defined in the act uh, as a director, manager, secretary, or similar officer of the corporate body. So a wide definition, which could potentially cover a, a wide number of people. And this reflects what we were saying earlier uh, about who may be liable in such circumstances. It's not the labels under which people perform their task that matter, but rather the scope of their duties and the actions which they carry out in that context. Moving on to um, uh, the Fraud Act, Section 12. Again, you'll see under Section 12, two very similar wording. That is consent and connivance, no neglect. And again, uh, those caught by Section 12 are Director, Manager, Secretary, or similar officer of the body corporate. There are offences where neglect is also included as an additional element. For example, the Environmental Protection Act uh, 1990, Section 157, as I've mentioned, the Health and Safety Work Act 1974, Section 37, uh, FISMA, Section 400, the Enterprise Act, Section 125, and the Insolvency Act, Section 432. Um, and if we look at uh, an example um, under the Environmental Protection Act 1990, Section 157, uh, again, you can see that the elements are consent, connivance, or 
to have been attributable to any neglect on the part of, and again, wide definition of who may be liable, director, manager, or other similar officers of the body corporate, or a person who is purporting to act in any such capacity. Uh, and uh, similarly, if we look further on at um, a case uh, under the Environmental Protection Act, um, Dhaliwal uh, is a case in point where uh, the defendant was a sole director and shareholder of Skip Hire Company that was storing mixed waste vehicle, um, materials, rather. And the local authority discovered the site, discovered that uh, the site was not, it was in breach of environmental legislations and not in accordance with its license. Um, the defendant was warned about uh, the breaches failed to heed them and was prosecuted. And in that case, the defendant was convicted and given a 25,000 pound fine and uh, an order to pay 25,000 pounds of prosecution costs. No separate penalty was passed on the company. And you, you'll see from the dicta of the Court of Appeal that, that they upheld that conviction and chose not to interfere with that sentence. Um, an authority in 2015, uh, in the same area of the Environmental Protection Act 1990, Albert Skip Hire, uh, in fact, a, a case I was involved in, um, that again involved a company that was dealing in waste materials and um, was said to have been in, in breach of both the Pollution Prevention and Control Act and the Environmental Protection Act 1990. Um, they were in, in breach of their licenses and uh, they were fined, the directors, £50,000, um, the director that um, I represented, who was the director of the company, um, and uh, he received a six-month sentence of imprisonment suspended for two years. The second defendant was, in fact, acting in that case as a shadow director, prosecuted and convicted as such, received an immediate custodial sentence, um, which concurrently totaled 12 months, and both were disqualified as directors of company for 10 years. So the sanctions can be severe. And the authority of Crown and Powell is interesting only to make the point that in addition to fining and custodial sentences and disqualification for lengthy periods, a uh, company or director may be proceeded against uh, in such criminal proceedings for the proceeds of crime. And that's in fact what happened in the case of Powell. So that is an additional level of um, sanction that can be pursued in these circumstances. Um, in terms of uh, Section 37 of the Health and Safety Work Act, again, we saw that this included the limit of neglect as well as consent and connivance. You can see that under Section 37.1. Uh, again, set out in a very similar way to the wording uh, under the Environmental Protection Act. And uh, examples in terms of um, authorities where directors and companies have been pursued is Thelwell was one, um, a 2016 case, which resulted in a fatality, sadly, uh, when uh, equipment uh, toppled and uh, fell on the employee, Mr. Williamson, uh, causing fatal injuries. And as a result of that, the company pleaded guilty and was fined um, uh, £166,000. Um, the appellant pleaded guilty to an offence under Section 37.1 that he had connived uh, in the commission of the offence or that um, neglect was attributable and he was sentenced to 12 months imprisonment. Um, and the appellant, uh, in fact, had a, a pre previous uh, conviction for a breach, which obviously was uh, part of the aggravating features in, in the case. Um, again, the Court of Appeal did not interfere with the sentence in that case. And if we look at, um, again, uh, another case of uh, Farrell, um, Similar circumstances of breaches that resulted in death in relation to which the director was said to be uh, consented, connived or neglected his duties. And again, um, there a total fine for the company of £96,000 plus £20,000 costs. And Mr. Farrell was fined a total of £14,000 and a period of 12 months in imprisonment um, with a, uh, in default of payment of um, a contribution order. Again, the Court of Appeal did not interfere. Looking at other uh, offences where, um, which are caught under uh, this legislation or other, other legislation, FISMA Section 400, uh, the officer as well as the body corporate under Section 1, 401B uh, is guilty of the offence where, and it defines again, uh, 
um, consent or mentioned consent connivance or neglect as the relevant limbs. And the officer is defined uh, under section 5A, 405A, as again, a director, member of a committee of management, chief executive manager, secretary, or other similar officer of the body, or a person again, purporting to act in such capacity. And if we look at um, consent and connivance or neglect as a defense under section uh, 432 of the Insolvency Act 1986, again, we see that the wording is very similar to the wording under uh, other legislation, such as section 37 of the Health and Safety at Work Act. Um, you'll hear more about um, insolvency and how that has an overlap with certain civil procedures for disqualification of directors, including section 9A of the Companies to, um, Directors Disqualification Act 1986 and section 9, which empowers the Competitions Markets Authority to uh, proceed against um, directors and officers and in certain circumstances hand down disqualifications. Uh, and, and lastly, to say this, before I hand over to Ruby, that as I mentioned before, the CDDA 1986 is clearly an important part of the landscape in terms of directors' liabilities. Uh, it gives judges powers to disqualify in the criminal as well as the civil sphere. And you'll hear more about the interplay between the two and the conflicts that can arise between corporate entities and their directors particularly in the context of deferred prosecution agreements in Ruby's presentation, which will follow. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Rufus. Uh, and as Rufus has pointed out, we're now going to ask Ruby to look more particularly, I think, at the area of sanctions and, of course, at that of disqualification of directors. Ruby? Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Rufus. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes about the civil obligations and the liabilities of directors. So these are the bottom two uh, hexagons on your slide on the right hand side. So I've put into uh, the next slide um, some of the areas from which civil and regulatory liability flow. Um, it's a number of different sources for company directors, notably the Companies Act, which Rufus has made mention of, um, but also in relation to listed companies, a number of pieces of legislation, including the corporate code, uh, the listing rules um, and the market abuse directive. The corporate code is enforced by the UK listing authority. It's a principle based standard of best practice. Um, which is published by the Financial Reporting Council. Um, and what it provides is um, a set of go-to principles um, which are best practice for corporates in the UK. Uh, a new version of it came out in July 2018 um, and it applies to accounting periods for companies which commence after the 1st of January 2019. And it brought with it a number of changes which relate to areas such as stakeholders, um, corporate culture, diversity, remuneration, um, and also sustainability. So the, the environment, um, the social, the governance element. Rufus has set out the statutory duties of directors which are codified in the Companies Act 2006. And, and I note here that part of a director's obligation to promote the success of the company, that's the section 172 obligation, is his or her role in ensuring that the company has in place the appropriate procedures and controls to prevent criminal activity. So this is where we see the implementation of, for example, adequate procedures to prevent bribery uh, or the facilitation of tax evasion, um, or where we see the importance of structures and policies um, to adhere to health and safety or environmental regulation. So essentially the flip side of some of the liabilities that Rufus has been talking about um, it, it's, it's the Companies Act that provides the framework for the responsibility of a director to ensure that those, um, uh, those uh, criminal offences are not committed. Um, and, and I think on this point, it's worth mentioning that for a listed company, there's also the listing principle one obligation that a company must take reasonable steps to establish and maintain adequate procedures, systems and controls to enable it to comply with its obligations. Uh, FISMA, 
um, is an important consideration, as is the senior manager's regime for anyone who is a director or a senior manager of a financial services firm. Um, the FCA senior manager's regime, which was recently expanded, um, it imposes onerous obligations on the most senior decision makers within regulated firms um, who are defined rather ominously as having the greatest potential to cause harm or impact upon market integrity. And as Rufus has mentioned, FISMA, which is enforced by the Financial Conduct Authority primarily, uh, is another source of obligation and liability for directors. Um, finally, I'm going to mention insolvency legislation, in particular the Insolvency Act 1986, which governs all aspects of company and individual insolvency. In the context of insolvency, there are multiple requirements of directors, and that is why we see the Insolvency Act and insolvency situations as those which appear so frequently in cases involving serious fraud um, and disqualification of company directors. The obligations start with the statutory and fiduciary duties to the company that Rufus and I have already mentioned. Um, but what we see commonly in the director disqualification case law is really indicative of the complexity of those insolvency situations. Um, failing to maintain proper records, which then mean that um, an administrator is unable to get to the bottom of why a company has failed. Uh, it, company directors who act out with the scope of the company's constitution, making agreements or arrangements that they're not permitted to, uh, where a director makes or authorises a payment in the knowledge that the company is unable to pay its debts, or where they don't act in the best interests of the company by overlooking the interests of a large creditor. And it's worth remembering that although it is the company that is becoming insolvent in these situations, it's the director who is exposed to liability. I pose a question at the bottom of this slide, um, which is a question about the potential conflict between the individual and the company. Inevitably, liability for individuals gives rise to conflicts with a company, um, and that arises simply from the fact that a corporate is a separate legal entity from its director. And the most obvious uh, uh, is the conflict of interest duty that Rufus has already mentioned under section 175 of the Companies Act. But I think perhaps more interestingly for this conversation, particular conflicts arise when misconduct or enforcement is in play. Should an individual cooperate with an enforcement agency in order to obtain the best outcome for herself? Um, what if providing a full account in an interview situation would result in the best outcome for a company? which might then be able to seek leniency, for example, but would expose that director to disqualification. Um, conflict can arise in the very earliest stages of engagement with a regulator, a prosecutor or any other enforcement agency. Uh, and it's important to remember it early, remember it throughout, um, and also to remember that the, um, the presence of an independent legal advisor for individuals is a key tool in minimising that conflict and ensuring that from a company's perspective the best decisions are made from an individual's perspective that their rights um, are protected. Those mentions are of course relating to the areas of conflict felt by an individual but it's important also to remember where that conflict is felt by enforcement agencies perhaps most starkly in a company's pursuit of a deferred prosecution agreement. These have been a feature of US justice for a, a long time, um, but are now a feature of um, the uh, part of the armory um, of prosecutors in a number of different jurisdictions around the world, including the UK, where we've seen their increased use by the Serious Fraud Office in recent years, um, cases such as Innospec, Tesco, the XYZ case, Rolls-Royce, Airbus, and only last week, uh, the Serco case. Conflict in this arena is clearly difficult for an enforcement agency to manage. Um, and a number of SFO cases have called out the discrepancy between the innocence of individuals who are later prosecuted and acquitted or against whom a prosecution is discontinued and the alleged involvement of those individuals in conduct which led to the DPA being approved by the court. 
there are clearly incentives for a company to name individuals and, and it's one of the factors which weigh in a company's favour in being able to achieve the successful outcome of a DPA. Um, but it can be a real problem for a prosecutor and for a court who then goes on to try those individuals and finds that perhaps the evidence against those individuals um, is not uh, sufficient um, to result in a conviction. I'm going to move on now to disqualification, um, which is imposed for an increasingly wide range of conduct. Um, and I'm going to talk um, about director's disqualification under the CDDA 1986. So disqualification is an order which prevents an individual from acting in the management, promotion or formation of a company. And um, a wide range of activities come within that definition, much broader than you might think. Um, and when advising a client, it's worth um, coming back to what that definition means and thinking expansively about practical examples that relate to that client's business, which would bring them within scope um, of a disqualification order. A breach of the order um, or an undertaking is a criminal offence. Um, it's an imprisonable offence. Um, and I, I note that disqualification can be by way of undertaking, that is a written agreement by an individual to be bound by uh, the terms of a director's disqualification. It has the same effect as an order, um, but it um, avoids the need for high court proceedings. A disqualification order is capable of variation by a court on the application of either party um, in the way that you might um, expect. So thinking first of all about what can trigger disqualification, uh, it can be triggered as an ancillary order um, following conviction uh, of an in indictable, i.e. a serious offence, um, often a fraud case, for example, that's tried in the Crown Court, and that's under Section 2 of the Act. Uh, frequently, perhaps much more frequently, um, is the presence of misconduct in connection with companies. Often companies act offences such as, for example, a, a Section 386 duty to keep accounting records. Um, and regular examples are things such as a director who allows a company to continue trading when it can't pay its debts, um, not sending accounts and returns to company's house, not paying for or accounting for the tax that's properly owed by the company, um, or this is where perhaps the, the criminal element is more likely to come in using company money or assets for personal um, or non-company benefits. Insolvency matters I've mentioned, um, I should note that automatic disqualification in most circumstances applies in the case of a bankruptcy. Um, and also in the case of breaches of competition law, which I'm going to come on to talk about in just a moment, um, those under Section 9A of the Act. So a disqualification for some offences is for a minimum of two years, for other offences or breaches there is no minimum, but there's a 15-year maximum. Um, it, it's plainly a serious, um, uh, a serious and significant order. Um, and it comes about where there is both the combination of a qualifying offence and the presence of conduct which is said to indicate that a director is unfit to continue to be a director. So in essence it is a public protection measure which is there to prevent an individual who is unfit to be a director um, from threatening um, the public. I've noted on this slide that the court needs to conduct at something akin to a sentencing exercise in order to determine the appropriate term. Um, the leading case of Seven Oaks uh, sets out the tariff for disqualification um, and it sets out three brackets, uh, the lower, the middle and the upper bracket, um, which are uh, essentially 0 to 5, 5 to 10 and 10 plus years and gives indications of the types of characteristics of conduct which would place an individual within one of those three categories. Um, the question of the sentencing exercise that's carried out when an undertaking is in play, I think is a really interesting and important one. Um, and I think there is a question over how confident an individual can be that that exercise is carried out properly by a public authority um, where a matter does not go anywhere near a court. 
an unlikely DPA that I've mentioned already, which is subject to court approval, an undertaking isn't subject to court approval. It's something which is approved and agreed between an individual and the public authority. And the sentencing exercise, as, as I'm sure all of you on this call will know, requires an examination of facts um, and then a consideration of aggravating and mitigating factors in order to reach a, a term which is both fair um, and not um, excessive. So as I say, serious orders, they can be for long periods. Um, certain public authorities are increasingly requiring longer periods as a way of um, uh, operating public deterrence. Um, and I think what's important to remember is in any of the types of cases that Rufus and I have talked about, uh, that consideration of the risk of disqualification needs to be had early and again needs to be considered um, throughout the case. So who seeks disqualification? Um, well, it's a wide range of enforcement agencies. Um, it's worth noting that members of the public can report a company director's conduct as unfit. Um, and uh, the revenue um, bays and the CMA um, are perhaps the most common. I'm going to go on and spend um, a, a, a couple of minutes now talking about director's disqualification in competition cases. Um, you may be aware that um, there, is, there has been a, a huge increase in the use of disqualification as an enforcement tool by the CMA um, in the last 18 months. Although the CMA has had the power to impose disqualification for more than a decade, it's really only in the last 15 months that that um, power has been used and there have now been 19 disqualifications in that period, along with clear statements by the CMA that they intend to use them in every applicable case. So a, a, a director's disqualification in a competition case follows the same format as it would for an insolvency or, or a, comp, a, a company matter or following a, a conviction on indictment. Um, they again have the same maximum and the threshold is that an individual needs to have breached competition law and that their conduct needs to make them unfit to be involved in the management of a company. Uh, applications are by way of a high court application if they go to court, but I should note that 18 of the 19 disqualifications have been by way of undertaking and only one case has been to court. Um, it was decided earlier this month um, and so that's an important indicator, um, I think, uh, of how crucial it is that the authority is, is behaving in a way which is, is fair because it's not under the gaze of a judge. Uh, I think one point to make on applicability is the breadth of a disqualification order for competition cases. They, they can be imposed um, where a director has contributed to the breach of competition law. That's perhaps unsurprising. But it's not only those who have been involved, it's those who ought to have known uh, that the conduct which took place was a breach of competition law. Um, and uh, that is a that that's a broad, um, a, a very broad aspect um, of the uh, of this provision. The first test case that I've mentioned that came before the court um, earlier this year and was uh, the, the judgment was issued in July. Um, was part of the residential estate, estate agent investigation um, uh, run by the CMA, which was into a cartel in, in Somerset. Um, and it was based on the, uh, uh, the involvement of an individual who had no involvement in day-to-day -day sales. He didn't attend the meetings during which the infringing conduct took place, but he was aware of the cartel and he took no steps to prevent it or to end his company's participation. And that failure to prevent, essentially, um, is what the court concluded meant that he should be disqualified as a director. I've mentioned the, um, that the burden standard of proof um, is to the civil standard. I think um, important to note here um, the, the breadth of these orders in competition cases and the fact that they are clearly on the increase. Richard, I'm going to stop now and um, hand back over to you for kicking off our discussion. Now I'm just about to show my picture in order to let you know that time is moving on. <laughs> right, well now um, let's move from those topics because I'm aware of certain items and matters that arise and I know we've considered them ourselves. 
but I want to perhaps start with Rufus, if we can. Uh, and it's in relation to the widening of criminal responsibility. I mean, as, as Ruby has pointed out, the Companies Act and solvency regime have always been there. But it seems in the last 20 years or so, there's been a massive increase uh, in uh, the, and a widening in the liability of directors and indeed managers. Would that be right? Yes, I think that is right. I think it's self-evident from, if you take the, the simplest test, the number of different pieces of legislation, some of which we highlighted in, in my part of the talk, that are specifically focused on wrongdoing by not just directors, as we know, but others holding a, a similar position. So the mere fact that there are so many pieces of legislation that specifically create liability for directors and uh, similar people of similar standing within the company is an indication of the widening of that liability. But it's not just that, it is the way in which then the offences are couched because, as we've said, um, it isn't just directors who are caught by this, it, it is also not just m senior managers, but managers, secretaries, other similar offices are the kinds of wording that are used in, in all the different pieces of legislation. And in addition to that aspect, who is specifically named as being potentially liable, under the, um, the elements of the offence, it's consent connivance in most offences, but also neglect. And neglect actually is a failure to do something that you ought to have done under this particular uh, concept, uh, under the various pieces of legislation. So it's not just things which you proactively do which are wrong, uh, but failing to take steps which you should have taken. And that in itself is a widening of liability. Um, and you, you, one, can, one can see why there are various reasons how, you know, how we've arrived at the situation. The Parliament has found it necessary to uh, widen liability, both in terms of the definition of offences and by passing more legislation, creating those offences. Uh, and we know about the, 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 the public concern over... Uh, banking behaviour during the bank, banking and financial crisis, going as far back as the Enron scandal, which led to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in the United States, which had an impact over here. And, and two of the things that arise from that is, uh, I think, a, a, a feeling that is quite broadly shared, that it isn't enough just to go after companies in order to ensure that uh, companies stick to the rules. You have to make senior managers, executives, directors, also responsible, otherwise the behaviours of company uh, or the behaviour of companies won't, won't change. And un unless you have both an approach, a twin track approach that makes the corporate uh, uh, liable, sometimes criminally liable, as well as the directors and senior managers, you can't affect the, the type, of, type of cultural change that needs to be affected. So it's really threefold, is it? There's been an extension in the areas covered by the legislation and we've seen obviously as different uh, matters like competition for example have become more a concern and then or we then get legislation which deals with it in specific uh, terms as it were so we got an increase do we not then in the areas where there's legislation we then get the increase in the number of people who are liable within the corporation yes and this means that what it goes outside board level it could go outside board level, yes, because it's so not... a manager yeah. who has no overall yeah. control yes. may still be responsible despite the fact that, for example, a director's not. Yes, that is possible in, in relation to particular wrongdoing. Um, and uh, I think that... Uh, I think what you've got to also consider is all these pieces of legislation will be passed. Another part of the equation that, that people you know, frequently raise is, well, the powers are there, to what extent are they being used? Uh, and that is a question. So all this legislation has been passed, it has widened liability. Are the powers being used by regulatory and prosecutorial uh, authorities um, as widely as they should be? So having been given the tools to do the job, are they actually uh, implementing those tools? Are they using them in order to affect the change that is desired? And the third thing to be aware of is this, is it not the increase in the liability by the introduction of neglect? And that means that you have to be alert to the fact that simply not knowing what is going on may in fact result in you being prosecuted, you as a director uh, or manager. Uh, and that's a, a, a limb beyond connivance, which is 
actively turning a blind eye, as it were, knowing what's going on but doing nothing about it. But neglect is uh, a, a, a further widening of liability, there's no doubt about it, because it's saying it's not just enough that you, you do your job properly, you've got to supervise and oversee that the company and, and those who are responsible in specific areas like uh, environmental protection, health and safety, are also doing their job. So it, it, it imposes a kind of supervisory burden on directors. They can't just sit back and read reports in board meetings and be satisfied they're carrying out uh, their duties. Yeah. They have to be more proactive than that. Yep. Ruby, turn to you for a moment. Um, you, you briefly discussed tariff, as it were, in relation to disqualification. Is there a, a difference between the tariff in criminal cases where a director has been found guilty of crime and the civil cases, or are they much the same? Well, I, I think the, uh, uh, superficially they're the same, Richard, but, but when you look at the authorities, I think they're very different um, because you're placing, the court is having to place side by side conduct which is considerably more serious objectively on the criminal side than it is on the civil side. So the insolvency authorities, which is in the main where the case law comes from because of the fact that it, it tends to be in insolvency situations that disqualifications are imposed. Um, you're looking at um, serious dishonesty in the criminal sphere against, for example, the conduct of the director I mentioned in the estate agents cartel, who was aware of anti-competitive behaviour going on in his company but did nothing to stop it. Um, and when you compare that sort of conduct and even more serious conduct on the civil side against what you have on the criminal side, I think it is very difficult that the tariffs appear to be the same. Um, Seven Oaks is a very broad um, approach to this, the, 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 the three buckets in which um, disqualification cases sit. Um, but I, I think it's very difficult to, to look at them one against the other um, and to feel that defendants or directors in civil situations are, are getting a getting a fair turn. Uh, a, a more a sort of direct and personal question. Do you feel, therefore, that uh, disqualification imposed in the civil area is more penal than preventative? Well, it isn't supposed to be. You know, the, it, it, this is supposed to be about the protection of the public from somebody who is unfit. But there are situations where, for example, a company uh, which is the subject to subject to a competition investigation is not able to be fined because, let's say, it has no revenue or turnover or where an individual is not able to be uh, the subject of a competition proceedings because he or she no longer owns the company which was responsible for the breach. And in those circumstances, perhaps the only tool that's left um, to, to use against this individual is disqualification. Um, and I think it's important that public authorities are reminded that this is a tool for prevention and not a tool for punishment. And of course, it's incredibly punitive to take away somebody's uh, ability to earn a livelihood. Very often, the age of people who are disqualified means that the order is career ending. Um, and clearly the, uh, it prevents somebody from earning a living unless they want to go and do something that's entirely different. But um, it, it, it has a huge economic impact on an individual and the company that they run. Um, and I think they are orders that shouldn't be dished out, um, dished out too generously. In the yeah. criminal sphere, um, often a period of disqualification sits alongside a period of imprisonment. So it's, it's, it's practical application is limited. Uh, but in the civil sphere, then that's clearly not the case. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think they can be used in, in a way that appears to be punitive. Can I, uh, thank you very much. Lydia. Can I ask both of you just to give some consideration to this matter? Uh, we had a lecture um, during the course of the seminars last year, I think, from the director of the Serious Fraud Office uh, relating to deferred prosecution agreements. Um, what is the position of a director if uh, DPA is actually agreed with the company? I'm appreciating the director may well have been involved in the negotiations, but does that prevent a director or indeed senior management from being prosecuted? Um, well, Rufus, if I, I'll start and then, um, and then chip in. Um, it, no, it doesn't prevent them being um, prosecuted 
by any means. Um, what it means in practice is that they have um, very little uh, role, um, if any, in the agreement of the DPA. They might be still a key director of the company, in which case, no doubt they would be involved. But let's say they're a director, a former director, or, or somebody who is persona non grata within the organisation. Um, they may have very little to do with it and, and very little say. Uh, of course, they can then be prosecuted after the event. But as we've seen in some of the um, significant prosecutions in, in this area, um, there has been a notable lack of success in successfully prosecuting individuals who are said to be key to the conduct which supports the DPA. Um, and I think there's a real difficulty in the way that um, the proceedings operate um, in this in this in this area. I think it's a real challenge. Uh, Rufus, did you want to come back in on that? Because time, I see, is moving on pretty. It quickly. is moving on. I, I don't think there's there's much that, that I can usefully add, except that I, I did note uh, in the DPA um, judgment in the Tesco case that um, came before the High Court in front of Sir Brian Levson that w w when um, uh, towards the end of the judgment, in fact, in the conclusions, he, he says something, he says this, in fact, there may be cynicism in some quarters about the process by which a corporate entity can take advantage of a DPA. He then goes on to say this cynicism is not well founded and gives the reasons. But uh, it, it, it's, it's striking that he should mention that because that, that, can't, that sort of reflects uh, an acknowledgement that there is worry right across the board as to whether or not when entering into DPAs, um, the corporate entity and the prosecutor um, are coming to a, an agreement um, on one basis and whether that could, as Ruby say, um, says, um, could compromise uh, a, a prosecution thereafter. We need to watch this space, it seems, is it? Prosecutors, sorry? We need to watch this space. I think, I think we do, but... Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we'll I'm sorry. The Tesco case. <laughs> I'm sorry to shut you up, um, but I think really time is... is pressing on. I know we're going to finish pretty quickly on time. Uh, so can I thank you both, please, for uh, your participation in this webinar? I'm sure it's been appreciated. It's certainly a very interesting topic. I think we really sort of skimmed the very surface of it to a certain extent, but thank you for all your efforts. Um, and thank you to you who are, have attended the webinar for attending it. Uh, we are continuing with uh, Red Lion Chambers webinars but we are taking a break for August and we're not uh, going to come back until the 8th of September of this year. But when we do, it's going to be with a bang, it seems, because we've got a very sparkling team of people uh, who are appearing in the next webinar. Indeed, it's being hosted by Dame Linda Dobbs. Uh, its topic is investigations, the challenges and opportunities after COVID. So although we've been rather uh, pessimistic about COVID so far as directors are concerned, there may be some opportunities there you'd be worthwhile listening to. The uh, speakers include uh, Baroness Heather Hallett, she's the former Lady Justice of Appeal and Vice President of the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. Sir Mark Rowley, lead on uh, UK counter-terrorism policing until 2018. Christopher Stone, Professor of Practice of Public Integrity, uh, at Oxford University's Blavatnik School of Government, and Tom Stocker of Pinsett Masons LLP. Sounds like it's going to be interested. We ask you, please don't forget it, and do register in time. Once again, I'm coming to give my special thanks to Tom Davis for all his help. This has been a Red Lion Chambers webinar. We hope you found it enlightening and that you will tell your colleagues about it. Thank you very much indeed.